What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the national airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News. 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your AM FM listing nearest you. Plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM Channel 80. Plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up is always is 888 say ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. Tune into the ESPN Daily Podcast, bringing you a deep dive into a single story from one of ESPN's hundreds of reporters. Presented by Dell Small Business. Download, subscribe, and review ESPN Daily. Available wherever you enjoy your podcast. Time for Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Got a lot of stuff to get into. If you are in the New York Tri-State area and you consider anything pertaining to the Jets and the Giants, riveting news, interesting news, know that the New York Jets have traded defensive linemen, former sixth overall pick in the NFL draft, Leonard Williams, uh, to the New York Giants. For two draft picks, a third and a future fifth round pick. Uh, the Jets traded the interior lineman to the Giants just about an hour or two ago. Leonard Williams of the New York Jets. No sacks. No sacks on this year. Five sacks last year. Two sacks the year before. Uh, no sacks this year thus far. Leonard Williams is being traded from the New York Jets to the New York Giants. We'll get into a little bit of that and then some considering a bevy of games that took place uh, yesterday in just a minute. A whole bunch of stuff to get into. First order of business, however, on my mind is the World Series. I just want to get it out the way because it's on my mind, but not for the reasons you would believe. Yes, the Nationals were in Houston games one and two against Garrett Cole, against Justin Verlander, beat them both, went up two to nothing. Yes, the Houston Astros then turned around and won games three, four, and five. Uh, The last two games by a score of 15-2 to combined and have now taken a 3-2 lead and are on the verge of closing out the World Series tonight. Yes, Justin Verlander will go up against Steven Strasburg tonight. Yes, Strasburg is big time, particularly in the postseason. And if the Nationals somehow correct the error of their ways over games three, four, and five, and Strasburg shows out like he has been doing this postseason, and there is a game seven, Houston could be in a world of trouble. The last time we've been this deep into a World Series, and neither team had won a home play, a home game, was 1996 New York Yankees. Means nothing right now, just 23 years later. The fact of the matter is the Nationals are here, the Astros are here. Garrett Cole handled his business last night, pitching a four-hitter, only giving up one earned run in seven complete innings. Masterful performance. He's going to be a free agent. And the reason why I say it's not necessarily about the World Series, it's as simple and plain to me. Houston's the better team. I picked them to win this World Series in six. I believe they closed the deal tonight. If somehow, some way, Strasburg derails them and Max Scherzer, who was supposed to pitch in game five, but due to neck and back pain, couldn't even dress himself, therefore couldn't even pitch. If somehow, some way, miraculously, he's ready to go and able to go for game seven. Who knows what will happen? So if you're Houston, to me, close the deal tonight. Shut down the na- the Nationals. Don't give them any life because there's a da- they're a dangerous team to give life to. Strasburg's going to have to do it himself. We know what he's capable of doing because we see what he's been doing in the postseason. He's absolutely been stellar with an ERA just over one. We know what he can do. But if any team can get to them, whether it's Correa, it's Bregman, it's Altuve, somebody, then you do it. And I have a per- I have a personal confession to make. I just have to put this out there. Ladies and gentlemen, that home run, and John, I don't know if we have it or not, because you know how we, you know, we, you know, one of the great, great calls in sports history, Havlicek steal it. He stole the ball. He stole the ball. One of the great, great calls in sports history took place about nine days ago. When the Houston Astros, Jose Altuve, smacked the game-winning home run off of Araldis Chapman. And that call was given by the great Joe Buck, who, by the way, whenever he opens his mouth, he shows up at a game, you know it matters because he's there. 
That's how I pride myself in feeling about NBA games. It matters when I'm in the building. Because I'm not showing up for any lackluster, meaningless, frivolous game. I show up, it matters. Because I got I'm a busy man. And I don't have time to waste with garbage. Which is why I wasn't at the New York Knicks home open a Saturday night. But that's a digression from the point. I'm not going to digress there. Okay? What I will say to you is this. One of the great, great calls, if you go back, John, and you really, really listen to that call from Joe Buck, Aroldis Chapman in Major League Baseball because of the heat that he can throw decides to get cute with back-to-back 87-mile-per-hour sliders, and Altuve smacked it to left center field. And the call by Joe Buck, Bow! Altuve has just sent the Astros to the World Series. And then you just hear the fireworks and you hear the crowd screaming. Pandemonium at Minute Maid Park. And Altuve just rolling around. I wish y'all could hear that sound. They're showing it on ESPN News right now. I wish you could hear it. I swear to you, on my soul, I have played that play back at least 55 times. I can't get over it. It hurts so much, but the call by Joe Buck was addictive. Literally, you hear him say that one sentence, Altuve has just sent the Astros to the World Series. And then you just hear the crowd going crazy and the fireworks and all of that stuff. As a Yankee fan, it hurt so much. It hurt to see that home run smacked. It hurt to see him running around the bases. It hurt to see Aroldis Chapman there with that stupid smile because he tried to get cute and it and got caught. All of that stuff is true. And oh, by the way, talk about bittersweet. This dude ends up getting American League close of the year. Like that means that I mean, talk about an irony. I was not happy about it. But I'll tell you something right now. If you get an opportunity, you need to go to the New York Daily News. You need to read this article about Garrett Cole. The the, the headline is, here's why Garrett Cole might have just made his last start as a Houston Astro. You need to read that. And I'm telling you something, after reading this and seeing a guy that was a marginal to average pitcher in his last two years in Pittsburgh go from that to being 35 and 10 as a starter with a 268 ERA since he has arrived in Houston, I got news for you. The Houston Astros are doing something right. They're doing something right. I mean, just think about it for a second. Put it all into its proper perspective. And understand what the hell is going on here. He went 19 and 22 with a 412 ERA in his last two seasons in Pittsburgh, but 35 and 10 with a 268 ERA since he's arrived in Houston. You look at his 602 strikes since 2018 compared to Verlander's 590. And remember that dude, Charlie Morton, that outpitched the Yankees in game seven of the ALCS in 2017? Remember him? He's eight with 441 strikeouts since 2018. These are former pitchers or present pitchers for the Houston Astros. Damn it, they're doing something right. And John, forgive me for belaboring this on a football Monday. But you talk about somebody that's gotten on my last nerves. I swear I wish I could send rotten eggs to the house of Brian Cashman. I'm telling you something right now. Now, I want to preface my comments about Brian Cashman by saying this. I am fully aware that he has done a hell of a job as a general manager. I'm not being stupid and advocating his firing, dismissal, or anything like that. But it doesn't negate the fact that Brian Cashman on this particular day and over the course of the last week is such a colossal disappointment. Brian Cashman, John, I don't know if you realize this. Brian Cashman's dream has come true. 
He's not working for George Steinbrenner any longer where the, the criteria is championships and going for it and pulling the trigger and getting the job done. Now the criteria for Brian Cashman is uh, we're about the process. It's about being good enough to compete. It's about giving ourselves a chance. Don't y'all notice how vague that is? So in other words, we get to the postseason. We give ourselves a chance to win a World Series. He's done his job. We had 30 guys on the injured list. We still won 103 games. We got to the ALCS. I did my job. Never mind the fact that Granke was out there. Never mind the fact that you once had a chance to get Garrett Cole. Never mind the fact that, hell, you could have got Verlander. Never mind the fact that the New York Yankees have been complaining for years, or New York Yankee fans have been complaining for years about the lack of an ace. Houston has three of them. Because Granky damn sure looked like one in game three of this World Series. They had three of them. We couldn't get one. This is Brian Cashman. We put ourselves in a position to win. We're good enough. We made the case. We tried, ladies and gentlemen. We fought the good fight. I mean, listening to this man is some sickness stuff right now. It hurts. I ain't gonna lie. Because there's a satisfaction with being a contender. Never mind the fact that you're the only squad, the only Yankee squad, since 1910 to have gone a full decade without making it to one World Series. Never mind that. Never mind that. No, 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 that's not important. No Yankee. No Yankee organization since 1910. That's more than a century. No Yankee franchise has gone a full decade without a trip to the World Series. But this one. And Brian Cashman literally is quoted, John, in the newspaper. I, 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 I'm going to sleep well at night. I'm going to sleep well at night. That's what we're living with, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're living with. 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. I just had to get that off my chest. I just got to get that off my chest. I'm not going to belabor the Lennon-Williams trade from the Jets to the Giants because the, the, the truth is, who gives a damn? Who gives a damn? It's not going to make much of a difference. Pat Sherman's still your coach. You're still fighting a good fight, but you're not good enough. Wasting away the best years of Saquon Barkley's career. And I say that knowing full well he's only in the second year in the league. Daniel Jones could play, but how many weapons have you given him? But you want to let go of Odell Beckham Jr. Why? Because it's good for the culture. What if Daniel Jones had Odell Beckham Jr. to throw the football to? Ever wonder how that would be? And speaking of Odell Beckham Jr., pasture isn't always green on the other side, huh? Did y'all see the Cleveland Browns go up against the New England Patriots yesterday? Did y'all see it? Because I did. And I got to tell you something right now. It's clearly obvious what's going on. It really, really is. And if folks can't see it, shame on you. See, the defensive coordinator for the New York Net, for the New York Jets, Greg Williams, should still be the head coach for the Cleveland Browns. That's what's going on. Freddie Kitchens is clearly in over his head. You can slice it any way you want to. He's clearly in over his head. Now, I understand Nick Chubb back-to-back fumbles. I understand Baker Mayfield with the underhand scoop that ultimately gets intercepted. Three turnovers in the first quarter against the New England Patriots is not a way to make the proper noise for yourself in a positive fashion. I get all of that. I understand it. But I'm going to tell you something else, too. 13 penalties, 13 penalties, 70 penalties on a year, an average of 10 a game. These are the Cleveland Browns. Ladies and gentlemen, they got a whole bunch of talent. Nobody can deny that. But when are we going to figure out the reality that the Cleveland Browns don't know how to play football? I'm talking about as a team. They do not know how to play football. Period. They don't know how to play football. We can slice it any old way we want to. And by that, I mean 
playing collectively as one unit, avoiding penalties, refraining from beating yourself. That's what the Cleveland Browns have not yet figured out. We've been saying the same thing about them in week eight that we were saying about them in week one. Undisciplined, lack of focus, too many mistakes, amateur head coach, relatively amateur second-year quarterback. The list goes on and on. And why do you find yourself in this situation if you're the Cleveland Browns? I'll tell you why. Because Baker Mayfield, Hugh Jackson foolishly didn't start out the season with Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield had a grudge. Baker Mayfield gravitated towards Freddie Kitchens. And because he gravitated towards Freddie Kitchens and he's the number one overall pick and John Dorsey is your general manager and he capitulated to a player still wet behind the ears, breath smelling like Similac. And you let this guy choose your head coach for you. Freddie Kitchens goes from a positional coach to an offensive coordinator to a head coach in a National Football League inside of one year. Now, when the hell does that happen? Who does that happen for? Can somebody explain that to me? You got coaches. And oh, by the way, I didn't bring up race. You know why? Because you got white coaches that have been toiling in the NFL for decades, starving for an opportunity like this. And you give it to Freddie Kitchens? Three different damn positions in the NFL inside of a year? Because Baker Mayfield liked him? Really? Really? And then you wonder why you're struggling. I think Baker Mayfield is going to be good. I think Freddie Kitchens ultimately is going to be good because I got news for you. I like some of Freddie Kitchens' play calling. Not as much as I like Kyle Shanahan who took Ron Rivera and the Carolina Panthers to school yesterday with all that misdirection he was throwing around against the Carolina Panthers last year. That's why the 49ers are undefeated and looking like a Super Bowl contender. But you, Freddie Kitchens, some of your play calling has been impressive. It can't be denied. But the reality is, is that even if Baker Mayfield can play, it don't look like it half the time. Freddie Kitchens might be able to coach. Don't look like it half the time. And when you consider the novice that he is in terms of all those times, all the mistakes that have been made and the lack of attention to detail and the absence of focus, you going up against Bill Belichick, it might have been the biggest mismatch of the weekend. I'll take it back because San Francisco against Carolina clearly looked like a mismatch, uh, a colossal mismatch. But but Freddie Kitchens against Bill Belichick wasn't too damn far off off the charts. You just got to look at this right now and say to yourself, where the hell, what the hell is going on in Cleveland? I'm not going to lie to you. If I'm the Cleveland Browns, I take Freddie Kitchens, I demote him back to offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. I give him both titles. Your job is to focus on the offense and in particular, Baker Mayfield. That's your job. Let me get a different overseer because he doesn't know that job yet. Now, I know you can't do this. This is flu goals, pie in the sky. I get it. But the bottom line is, Freddie Kitchens should have never been a head coach of this team at this particular juncture. I'm not saying he's not head coach material down the line, but he ain't ready yet. He's not ready yet. And as a result, Odell Beckham Jr. only has one touchdown on the year, looks like a shell of himself. Jarvis Landry don't look as good as he can look. Nick Chubb running for 131 yards on 20 carries, still fumbling the ball, inclement weather. We get all that. How much is Kareem Hunt going to help this team? We don't know. In Joku, we don't know. The bottom line is, is that this team has got his mind in different places. And Odell Beckham Jr., a superstar talent without question. What the hell do you think you're doing? Wearing gold pleats so you can give it to Tom Brady after the game. What is this? What are you going to do? Get on, get on your knees and bow to him next? You're going against him. What the hell are you doing? To go into the game with the gold pleats on, ready to give it to Tom Brady after the game, letting everybody know before the game. What you want? Why don't you just go? Why don't you just take off his drawers and go do his laundry next? Why don't you do that? He's the opposition, damn it. He's your competitor. What the hell are you doing? 
You can't do that in the offseason? I know how great Tom Brady is. Shake his hand after the game. Tell him he's great. Fine. But going to wear gold pleats to give it to him? Is Tom Brady retiring, John? I haven't heard. Is this some retirement ceremony he's scheduled for? Is this the swan song that D. Wade and Dirk Nowitzki went on in the NBA last year where everybody's posing for pitches against them, which is clearly understandable since it's this swan song? I get it. Tom Brady hasn't talked about retiring this year. Where's he going, Odell? Where's he going? Hey, Jesus, this is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. You busy losing games, warm weather, cold weather, rain, snow, sleet, sunshine, don't matter. Y'all sticking up the joint more often than not, and you prioritizing wearing gold cleats for the opponent. I mean, what the hell you do that for? You trying to match his shoes with your hairstyle? What is up? Damn. You try to give these guys all the credit in the world. You're trying to focus on football. You're trying to make sure you don't make something out of nothing. And all of this, you're trying to be fair. But my goodness, talk about stuff that gets in the way of competition. I ain't going to lie. I'd rather, I'd rather cats hate each other and going up against each other than love one another. D-Wade, my man, I couldn't stand all that hug fest him and LeBron James was always doing. It made me sick. I'm talking about when they went against each other. Hug each other after the damn game. One time, LeBron came back to Miami after leaving Miami to go back to the Cleveland Cavaliers. He shows up in Miami to play a game. Him and D-Wade laughing and hugging up one another at time. And this kind of stuff drives me nuts. He can't wait till after the game. Good Lord. 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. We'll continue talking some football as we mosey on along. New York Giants lost another game. Cincinnati can't win a game. Drew Brees is back. Jameis Winston has a great, great defender speaking out on his behalf. Chicago still got kicker problems. The Eagles may have saved this season. Atlanta stinks and needs a new head coach. And the Steelers should have another win tonight. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Back with your calls and more in a minute. Oh, by the way. 